today, um, I'm going to talk about mushrooms and trees. Um, I think this is a really exciting topic that I didn't really get introduced to until really late in my graduate career. And so, um, yeah, I think it's a very important topic and it's a very, it's a topic that relates very closely with one another. And I think it's incredibly important. So uh, in part of this talk, I will also be talking about fungi because they are obviously very closely um, synonymous with mushrooms. They're not exactly the same thing, but I will um, explain that difference in a minute. Um, and so a little bit about me is uh, that I am originally from the Cajun capital of Louisiana, which is Lafayette. And after I received my Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science from Loyola University in New Orleans, I did an ecology assistantship in Augusta, Georgia, where I was uh, studying uh, island biogeography. And uh, afterwards, I worked at the Southern, Southern Environmental Law Center as a legal assistant before I decided to go to the University of Maine to pursue a master of uh, forestry. And uh, there I actually conducted an urban ash street tree study and created an emerald ash borer preparedness plan for the town of Orono um, because that is an invasive insect that is impacting a lot of our ash trees uh, nationwide. And now I'm back in the South and I'm very happy to share my skills with the community and also learn from the community as well. Um, so I'll dive into a little bit of mushroom history here. Um, obviously mushrooms couldn't be cultivated uh, at first. They were, there was the hunter-gatherer period where, uh, you know, humans were um, not cultivating plants, but they were probably, they were hunting animals and they were also probably foraging for mushrooms along the way. Um, and about 4,600 years ago, uh, Egyptians actually believed that mushrooms were plants of immortality. So they thought, you know, mushrooms were said to be reserved for royalty and common people were not even allowed to touch them. Um, so about uh, 3,500 years ago, truffle mushrooms also started to be collected. Um, and about 2,000 years ago, Romans thought that mushrooms were the food of the gods. Um, about 370 years ago, or in the 1650s, uh, the cultivation of mushrooms in Western cultures uh, was first recorded in Paris, France, and that was uh, Grericus uh, bisporus, or uh, that was also called the shop mushroom. Uh, it was a form of um, criminy or portobello mushroom that also falls in that uh, family. And it was uh, actually first observed growing in uh, melon crop compost. So this, um, this mushroom was actually first observed in uh, open fields and um, as well. And so uh, it began to be uh, cultivated in open fields for 160 years. And then it was moved underground into caves and uh, excavated tunnels or quarries. And this form of cultivation is actually still used in France today. Um, and so about 150 years ago, or the eight, in 1865 about, variants of uh, Agraricus bisporus um, are, are starting to be grown in the US. And today, mushrooms have kind of picked up popularity. Uh, you may have seen them as kind of the newest health craze, and I'll kind of go into why that is. Um, and so uh, they kind of, they, they're kind of in vogue now, they're kind of coming around. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what a mushroom is. So I found this really nice um, anatomical diagram of a mushroom, um, you know, because uh, I think it's very interesting. This is a great diagram if you're kind of just starting to learn the parts of a mushroom. Um, but uh, my, my friend actually pointed out that it kind of misrepresents mushrooms in a way. And I'll talk about why that is as well. Um, so estimates range that there are 12 million fungi species on earth, but not all produce mushrooms because a mushroom is a fruiting body of a mycelium. And so mycelium is made up of hyphae, which are thin strands of cells that make up the fungus body. And so hyphae branch into this larger mass, you know, underground that are called the mycelium. So um, this is uh, on the left, it shows the different types of gills, which I'll also show. Um, and so this is a more, a little bit more of a detailed diagram and a little bit more accurate diagram of what a mushroom looks like. So you can see the fruiting body on the top 
that is pretty synonymous with say how a uh, peach tree grows peaches, uh, mycelium grows mushrooms. So that's the reproductive structure of the mycelium. Um, and so uh, they produce, the mushroom produces the spores and then they go on to reproduce and make more mycelium and um, more mushrooms. And so why are mushrooms so important? Well, they, they are these ecosystem puzzle pieces that um, really help, you know, obviously whenever things die or are dying, they help to really break those uh, pieces down. So they're really important pieces of the ecosystem puzzle. And um, so they also take nutrients. They help tree roots by taking nutrients from plants, um, by, but also providing water and nutrients to the roots. So the fungus colonizes its host uh, root tissues and improves the host moisture and nutrient absorption capabilities. And in exchange, the host plant provides the fungus with carbohydrates uh, produced through photosynthesis. So for the most part, there is this symbiotic relationship and exchange. Um, plants with mycorrhizal fungi also tend to thrive compared to those without them. So I wanted to also point out that I worked at an insectarium and uh, they used to talk about how there were no uh, terms such as good or bad bugs because bugs don't really know any better. Bugs are just doing what they do by nature. Um, but I wanted to point out that there are really no bad mushrooms. Uh, there are only poorly placed mushrooms, for example, non-natives. Um, or poorly used mushrooms as far as edibility. So I think that it's very important to understand the difference um, between what these uh, natural systems are going through uh, and how they, how they have come to where they are. So uh, this is a scary looking science diagram that I put up here, but um, ignore all the small text, just look at the top. I wanted to talk about a little bit uh, to really hammer home the point that about how closely related um, fungi are and the mycorrhizal relationships are with plants, so much so that they are actually embedded with sometimes within the plant roots themselves. So ectomycorrhizae, ectomycorrhizal relationships basically means that they, they are on the outside. So that's that prefix ecto meaning out, outer. So you can see that um, here they kind of go within between, or between the cells, but not within them. And then endo, this prefix endo, is means inside. So then you actually have these, um, you have the mycorrhizae, the mycorrhizae actually entering the root. So one penetrates the cell wall and the other does not. Um, but that's how closely uh, related and that's how closely uh, interlocked these species are. So, uh, why are mushrooms important for humans? Uh, for humans, they're actually really nutritious. And I think that that is why they're coming around is that they are great sources of vitamin D2, um, which is generated through sun exposure. And it can actually, um, you can actually manipulate this whenever you are eating mushrooms apparently by uh, slicing the mushrooms to increase the surface area. And you can lay them out in the sun because they'll absorb that and uh, the vitamin D and that'll that has been shown in the Journal of Nutrition and Food Sciences to increase the amount of vitamin D in a mushroom by up to 25%. Um, they're also great sources of uh, ergothionine, which acts as an antioxidant and it has to be eaten by humans as opposed to created. And it's an important amino acid. Uh, it's such an important amino acid that it was recommended to move up to the status of vitamin. Um, it has not been, but it is a very important amino acid. And uh, mushrooms with higher levels uh, include shiitake, uh, oyster, mitake, and portobello mushrooms. They are also uh, great sources of vit uh, B vitamins. Um, there is actually a difference between pseudo B12, which is unusable, and uh, the correct um, B and uh, active B12, which is biologically us usable for your body. Um, and so sometimes uh, mushrooms can actually have B12, um, the amount of B12 as high as uh, in other foods that we eat, such as eggs and cheese. So uh, mushrooms high as high in B12 as these include black trumpet and chanterelles, 
Um, and they do contain biologically active B12, so not the same, not the pseudo B12. Um, and this is important, uh, you know, if, if you don't eat as much meat or if you don't eat any meat at all, mushrooms are actually a really good source of B12. Um, they also contain um, soluble and insoluble fiber, uh, about two to 12 grams per 100 grams or uh, one and a half cups. Um, they're also, uh, the recommended fiber intake for an adult uh, person is about 25 grams per day, and it's associated with weight loss and has a positive effect on your gut microbiome biome, and can decrease the, decrease the chance of getting certain types of cancer. And um, uh, that's not to say that any of these mushrooms are a cure-all for any of this, but it's just to, you know, uh, kind of underscore the point that uh, and, and eating mushrooms is actually a very important, uh, can be a very important, important part of your diet. Um, and I do have Willow <laughs> saying um, also glucans and other glycoproteins, uh, complex polysaccharides, which act as amino, um, immunomodulatory drugs and uh, ba which balance uh, activity of the immune system. So thank you, Willow. Um, and I appreciate Willow being here today as an aside. Um, Willow is my dear friend from Maine and she is incredibly well-versed in a lot of mushrooms. Um, she helped me tremendously with this PowerPoint and I uh, would love it if she chimes in at the end and hopefully she can answer some questions um, because I think that she is an excellent resource. Um, so I do wanna also talk about how mushrooms uh, relate to trees on kind of a relationship, uh, an interlocking relationship level ecologically. So uh, as recently as 1903, some mushrooms such as truffles were actually believed to be a product of oak trees and because that's how closely related they were. Um, and they were, they were so closely associated. So uh, many mushrooms can only be found around trees and they're extremely hard to cultivate. Uh, for example, truffles and morels. Um, this is why they're truffle hunting pigs. And so, uh, you know, they can actually sniff out the mushrooms. Um, so there are these three main relationships, the first being mycorrhizal, which is uh, also known as symbiotic. Uh, it forms, it's whenever a mushroom uh, for, or uh, the mycorrhizae form a symbiotic relationship with the tree, uh, meaning that they both benefit from it. As I mentioned earlier, there's that exchange of nutrients and moisture. Um, mycorrhizae mycorrhizal fungi can extend a plant's root system by up to 1,000 times, which is um, which increases its nutrient and uptake and um, moisture capacity. So a significant role is uh, fi uh, finding and finding and retrieving these hard to capture nutrients such as organic nitrogen, phosphorus, and iron. And some examples of this include truffles, chanterelles, um, matsutake, por uh, porcini mushrooms or bolites, and morels. Um, and then there's a parasitic, which um, as you can see, I kind of put these symbols next to them. So one of them kind of has this positive relation or uh, positive beneficial relationship for both organisms. One of them has a negative relationship on one, on one organism, but a, po a, a positive relationship on another. Um, so they feed, this parasitic relationship uh, is when a mushroom feeds off the tree. So they'll extract nutrients at the expense of the host tree. And an example of this can include hen of the woods, um, powdery mildew. So I understand that that's not necessarily um, a mushroom, but it is a fungi. And I think that's important because that's what you see on a lot of garden plants. Um, there's also root rot and other forms of tree rot. So um, this, there's also saprophytic. So that's kind of, um, it can be a neutral. There sometimes can blur the line between parasitic and sap saprophytic because a lot of the times, you know, sometimes trees have, you know, um, are kind of on their way out um, as far as their life cycle goes. And so the mushrooms are just kind of helping that process along. And so the saprophytic uh, feed off of dead material and include uh, saprophytic mushrooms feed off, uh, yes, the dead material on the tree. So examples of this include oyster mushrooms, um, sometimes turkey tail. Um, and again, sometimes that line can be a little bit uh, blurred on already weakened trees. Um, this is a diagram that I actually found on NPR. And it is, to me, it does exemplify it pretty well, although rudiment, it is a pretty rudimentary drawing. But, um, you know, there's the fir tree uh, on the left. And then you have the fir seedling that's connected. 
Um, you have the fungi kind of in between that's kind of connecting all of these underground, almost like, um, you know, uh, kind of just all these inner network uh, and interlocking systems. So as you can see, uh, this diagram shows that the nutrients are moving back and forth. So you have um, carbon, water, and phosphorus, there's nitrogen, um, and it just shows to me this interlocking relationship between a lot of the trees. And I thought it did a good job of, you know, kind of stepping back and looking at uh, what the fungi is actually doing underground. So the purple part would be the mycelium. And then obviously you have those fruiting bodies, which are um, the red part at, on uh, the ground there. So um, here's a little bit of a review. Uh, we do have a little chat question I'll try to answer. Um, so, oh, uh, Willow actually is adding that um, the heartwood is dead and susceptible to saprotrophic fungal uh, digestion. Even though it's dead, um, it does hold the tree up. So thanks, Willow. Um, so I wanna go to this review that, you know, um, I put a little hint there because there is a tree talk that I did in June, uh, this past June, 2021 on tree ID. And so I wanted to uh, talk about the um, mnemonic device, which is Dear King Philip, come over for a good soup. And it's just a good reminder to keep in mind that it, it stands for domain, kingdom, phylum, class, uh, order, family, genus, and species. So when we're talking about um, the mushroom here, we're talking about the family, the genus, and species a lot of the time. And when you see a mushroom's name, you're mostly talking about, uh, you have the first word, which is the genus, and then the second word, which is the specific species epithet. And this is just kind of how ecologically it gets more specific. So I know it looks overwhelming, um, but if you wanna check out our tree talk on uh, tree ID uh, and just kind of have a refresher, um, it would probably help out a lot. And um, so now I just want to tell it, <laughs> short story, um, which is that Willow uh, one time told me that, you know, she said she was talking to someone and they said, oh, I found the best spot for this specific species of mushroom. And um, she said, oh, well, you know, is it on the southern part or is it on a south facing part of a sloping hill? And they said, oh my gosh, yes, that's it. How do you know? And that's because this is Willow. Uh, she <laughs> knows her mushrooms and she knows her trees and their mushroom species. So this is really how trees and mushrooms relate to each other is that if you wanna know your mushroom species, you really also have to know your trees. So, um, so she knew that and she knows that very well. And so I will go through and I'll kind of talk about the trees um, first and then I'll talk about the mushrooms that uh, tend to have these relationships um, with the trees because it is really important to know both because they are so interconnected ecologically. So the first one that I wanna talk about is oak trees because mushrooms love oak trees. Um, they love live oak trees, they love dead oak trees, they really love dead oak trees. Um, but the first one that I wanna talk about is the red oak and that's Quercus rubra. Um, so the characteristics are that it, it grows uh, 100 feet or more. Uh, there are those pointed leaf ends and there's smooth gray streaked bark that kind of looks like ski tracks. Um, the habitat areas tend to be well-drained upland uh, slopes. And um, there's also white oak, which is another um, section of, uh, of oak. So there's, as you may have noticed, uh, when you see red oaks, um, you'll see those pointed leaves and then you'll see white oaks, which have those rounded uh, lobes on their leaves. So they grow in very similar areas to the red oaks, but they do prefer drier areas than a lot of red oak species. So they still like those well-drained upland sloped areas. Um, so uh, they also, here's a list of a lot of very common mushrooms that you'll find with oak, uh, uh, oak trees and growing in and uh, near and um, around and on oak trees. Um, the first one that I'll go through is uh, Hen of the Woods. So that's Griffola frondosa, and it's also called sheep's head mushroom. So normally you can find it uh, late summer and fall, and it's a saprophyte. So that means that it is growing on that dead wood and it's also edible. So there's also chick, uh, the chicken mushroom or um, chicken of the woods. So there, as there is Hen of the Woods or also chicken of the woods. And they are two different mushrooms. So this is um, Latoporus sulfurus. And so that grows in the spring, summer, and fall. Um, 
It can grow on dead or very weak oak trees, so also kind of a saprophyte there, um, and it also is edible. And sometimes whenever you're walking in the woods, um, you know, a honey mushroom is really good for um, collector, like um, mushroom hunters, and uh, that would be um, Arm Armillaria malaya, and that grows in the fall. Um, so it, a lot of mushroom collectors would be really happy to see this species. However, um, the tree might not be as happy for it because it actually is a parasite and, a sap or, and or saprophyte, um, but it also is edible. There's also turkey tail. Um, I think this is the most common mushroom that I saw growing up. Um, so it, uh, it's in Louisiana as well. And so there's a uh, Tramedes versicolor and that actually grows in the fall. And that's a sap saprophyte as well. Um, uh, <laughs> Willow says that it is a forester's nightmare. Um, so uh, it is a saprophyte and um, it is edible, uh, yes, but it is better in tea. So it's not, um, super edible. It wouldn't be considered a choice edible is uh, what a lot of mushroom collectors call um, mushrooms that are, um, I mean, kind of what the name implies, which would be a higher preference uh, to eat. So there's also um, black trumpets, which are uh, Craterella spalax, and that is in the summer and fall. Um, that is a mycorrhizal species, so it does have that symbiotic relationship, uh, and it is also edible. And if you've been walking around the farmer's market recently in Savannah, then you might have run into Ansel Jacques who, uh, who owns Swampy Appleseed and he was selling smooth chanterelles. Um, that's Cantharellus uh, later lateritis. And that is about in the summer. So I think he just uh, ended uh, a lot of his uh, chanterelle, um, a lot of his, I think he's just moved over to oyster mushrooms potentially. So I think that that season is phasing out now and it's, you know, mid-September. So that sounds about right. And uh, it's a mycorrhizal species as well. Uh, it's also edible. So, and they're delicious. I've had them. <laughs> they're great. Another good tree species to know if you're looking for mushrooms is uh, Fagus grandifolia or um, Fagus species. So um, these are only the only native beach in the US. Um, they are uh, in the same family as oak trees. So that's Fagaceae, so that family genus species level. So obviously they have a lot of the same types of mushrooms um, that may be growing um, on oak trees. So um, it's a late successional species, which means that um, uh, it is growing after a lot of the other trees have already matured. So it kind of likes to be a little bit more in the understory. Um, it was hit pretty hard by uh, beech bark disease, which is a, fun a fungus from the Nectria genus, which causes be beech bark disease. And it was carried here by a scale insect in the late 1800s. So um, normally it, a beech tree will have really smooth bark, kind of like in this uh, section here. But if it gets um, infected by the nectria fungus, it'll have these kind of pock marks on there. Um, and so now this is also uh, land managers kind of see them as the hydra of the forest, if you will, because if you cut them, they'll just re-sprout and they're really hard to get rid of because they don't grow very large and they're not great merchantable species anymore because of this uh, scale insect introduction and, and therefore uh, the fungus introduction. Another great tree uh, is the beech. So, um, uh, or I'm sorry, not beech. These, these are the beech mushrooms uh, list. So, the as I mentioned, beech and oak are in the same family. So here's kind of some overlap here, uh, such as the hen of the woods or sheep's head, which um, already covered. And then there is also lion's mane, which I think is honestly, it looks like a chandelier. It's so pretty to me. I really like it. And it's um, Hericium arnaceus. Um, um, and that is in the fall. And that's also a saprophyte. So um, that's that'll be growing on, you know, uh, dead down beech trees, and it is edible. Um, it is, a, it's a great mushroom. And that's kind of another one that's come around as kind of um, a health craze type mushroom that I've noticed. Um, and there's also um, Okay, so um, Willow has mentioned that lion's mane actually um, 
contains chemicals that may aid in the regeneration of uh, damaged nerve tissue. So that's why it's come around as kind of, um, you know, more of a health uh, related mushroom. Um, so there's also uh, bear's head tooth, which is uh, in the Herisium genus as well. So that's um, again, in the same genus as lion's mane. And um, that would be in the fall and it's another saprophyte and that also is edible. Um, so there's also more black trumpets. <laughs> so I covered that, but that's summer mycorrhizal species edible. Um, and there's, you know, another one in um, the chanterelle genus. So that's uh, cinnabar uh, chanterelle. So uh, cantharellus cinnabarinus, and that one grows in the spring to fall. It's also mycorrhizal and it also is edible. Um, there's also the hedgehog mushroom, which I think is really great. It is uh, Hydnum uh, repandum, and it is it has these really neat, um, instead of um, the gills, it does have the teeth. So that's a really key identifier there. Um, I've never personally found one, but um, I think that they're really interesting looking. And um, they're in the, they grow in the late summer to fall, and they're also mycorrhizal, and they are edible. Um, a great one to know is the birch, particularly if you are up north, but we do have river birch uh, species down here and they grow from about uh, 40 to 70 feet uh, in height. Um, they have those sharply tooth uh, edged leaves. I, I kind of confuse them with, uh, I used to confuse them with elm trees because I think that they look similar, but elm does kind of have a rough um, top. And down here, you, it's actually, uh, birch trees are very identifiable because of that kind of peely, papery bark. Um, so they grow on river ba banks, uh, hence the name river birch most of the time. And uh, they grow in upland sloped areas. And they're also what's called a pioneer species. So pioneer species have to be very hardy, just like pioneers. And they normally um, inhabit an area that has been disturbed. And then they're normally the ones that come in and make the area a little bit more suitable for other uh, plants. So we have river birch and it's a great species. And here are the birch mushrooms. Um, so this is just a list. I did include one that is not edible. Uh, I, I thought it was important to also talk about, you know, the, um, a lot of the identifying features. So we'll talk about that. Um, so there's also, um, there's also uh, shaga mushroom. So there's uh, Inonotus obliquus. So that's in the late fall and winter. Uh, it is a parasite on birch uh, trees. So this looks like either a white birch or a gray birch. So they mostly grow up north, um, but I think it's, this is an important mushroom because this is another one. Um, which does have uh, potential health benefits. And mostly you can make a tea out of it and it is a parasite. Obviously, as you can see in this photo, it's pretty ingrained in the tree here. Um, and so there's also the birch polypore, which is uh, Formitopsis betulina. Um, so the Latin name for birch is, um, it's in the Betulaceae family. So um, it's betula. And if this is, to me, it maybe looks like a yellow birch, but um, that's Betula alleganiensis, and uh, Betulina the, from the form of topsis comes from Betula, which it me means birch. So um, there's a birch polypore, and it mostly shows up in the spring and summer. Um, it's also a parasite, and it is edible. Um, there's also, again, the turkey tail <laughs> pops up a lot, um, so we won't go really through that, but um, this is Cortinarius amaryllidus. And so uh, it's not edible, not recommended for eating. Um, I just think it's really important. Uh, I will come back to this about the differences and kind of how you can tell sometimes. Um, so uh, it is a mycorrhizal species uh, that is not edible, but you can see that it kind of just looks like your run of the mill mushroom, which is why you really have to, you just don't go out and eat any mushrooms if you're not 100% sure that that's what mushroom it is. So this is the elm tree that is also very important to know. Um, elm trees are incredibly historically important in America because the uh, Liberty Elm was actually where a lot of colonists would meet to talk about the oppression of British rule. But um, obviously we're here to talk about mushrooms and not, um, not the oppression of British rule. So I just, I thought it was a very, it's an important tree. 
that you can identify by the tooth leaves, the rough uh, leaf top sometimes, but down here we actually have the lace bark elm, um, which is uh, introduced and uh, it does not really have that kind of um, rough leaf top, but it is on a lot of native elms, you can kind of tell. Um, and it does have a buttress base um, and it does have a base shape. So you, it kind of goes a little bit more um, at, an ang at a more acute angle than a lot of trees. And uh, it grows in moist habitats along streams and in mostly areas that are uh, slopes that are leading down to or in bottomland uh, or floodplain areas. Um, an important thing about elm trees is that I mentioned that it was historically important because there's a pathogenic fungus in uh, the Ophiostoma genus that's responsible for Dutch elm disease, which is an incredibly detrimental disease to elm trees. Uh, it was found in the US in the late 1920s, and it works with elm bark beetles to wipe out elm trees. So this is again why it's really important that we pay attention to what we're moving around, um, because these trees you don't really see in the forest as large as they used to be, um, or as many. Um, but now we kind of see a lot of like medium-sized elm trees if they if they have been kind of spared uh, by this insect and the fungus. So here's a list of the elm mushrooms. Uh, uh, it's a short list <laughs> for now, but um, a lot of uh, morel species grow in hardwood forests. So the yellow morel, which is Morchella americana. Uh, that grows in the spring summer and it is mycorrhizal. Uh, it's also edible. And there's dryad saddle, which I think is a, a good common name for it. Um, and they also have uh, this Cereoporus squamosus. And they grow in the spring to summer uh, or, or fall. So it's a little bit of a wider season there. Um, they're saprophytic and parasitic. Um, they're also edible and ideally when they're young though, um, and they smell like watermelon rind and they also kind of taste like watermelon rind. Another one is the elm oyster. So that's Hypsozygous omerius and that grows in the spring or summer. Um, it's parasitic, as you can see, it's actually growing on the tree in this photo. Uh, and that is also edible. There's the black morel, which is um, Morchella angusticeps. Uh, that is associated again with hardwoods. Uh, that also includes uh, sycamore and persimmon. So um, the, it grows in the spring to summer and it's mycorrhizal uh, and it is edible. I um, wanted to talk a, a little bit really briefly about the diversity of morels because I thought this was really neat. Um, so a lot of them grow in these hardwood uh, forests, but uh, I had the misconception that they, I, I thought that you could find morels after, only after a fire, but that's not true. Um, these species are found after a fire um, and Willow will have to remind me the, the word for a lot of these species that are found after areas that have gone, undergone a fire. So these are um, Willow's photos. She's, so she's seen all of these, which is pretty cool. Um, and so a lot of mushroom hunters will go out actually after a controlled burn <laughs> to go find uh, morels. Um, so this is, I wanted to also emphasize why fire is such an important part of the ecosystem is that um, obviously, you know, a lot of these mus mushroom species also depend on it along with, um, along with the tree species and as well. Uh, there's also pine species, speaking of uh, a lot of fire dependent species. Um, there are, um, there's a lot of pine species. Um, so, um, yeah, so there's these pine species that are, uh, that can grow in height of over 100 feet. Uh, they have needles in bundles of two to five. A uh, fun fact is that the needles are called fascicles and they are, uh, they have this rough scaly bark. I'm sure almost everybody in the South can probably point out what a pine tree looks like. Um, they are also pioneer species, super hardy. So they grow in the pine plantations in the Southern US. Um, a lot of the times these pine plantations um, do undergo some control, uh, controlled burns, um, mostly before the pine is planted. And that's for sanitation purposes most of the time. Um, so these control burns, uh, again, create those morels uh, in other places. So um, Willow is reminding me that the, the burn morels is the name of the morel species, um, Morchella tomentosa and Morchella uh, capitata. So there's a wide variety of pines, which is a pretty cool um, 
pretty cool fact about pines is that they cover habitats, including boreal, subalpine, temperate, tropical, and arid woodland ecosystems. So that's a huge variety. There's a lot of pines out there. Um, this is a, just a couple of pine mushrooms. Um, there are more, obviously, but um, one of them is the uh, chicken fat <laughs> mushroom. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, it's not the most pleasant looking mushroom, but it is Willis americanus. Um, it's it grows mostly in the fall and it's mycorrhizal. Uh, it's edible, but it's not a choice mushroom. And as you can see uh, under the cap there, there are pores instead of gills or teeth. Um, there's also painted suillus, which is suillus pictus. Um, that grows in the summer and fall. Uh, that's mycorrhizal as well. And, um, and there's also uh, a, a kind of a cautionary thing here is to beware of lookalikes. So when you're kind of looking for mushrooms, if you are interested in that, um, then there are, um, this is one example. These are jack-o'-lantern mushrooms. Um, they're not technically classified as deadly, but it would not be a fun time if you confuse them with uh, chanterelles, for example. They look very similar. And so it's really important um, to understand how the difference is. So one way that you can tell that actually is by the cap. And um, I thought it was really interesting because I didn't know about the differences. I didn't know that mushrooms could have this many differences, which is making me appreciate them a lot more. One of them is that um, you look at the gills. So um, you look at where they attach and you can kind of see whether or not it's, um, it attaches fully. And so there are gills, um, there are teeth, like the hedgehog mushroom. And I'm gonna put a trypophobia warning here because I thought that, you know, I have a, I have a friend who has trypophobia. And um, so there are uh, small holes clustered together coming in the next photo and that is pores. So um, these are the types of um, kind of features that you'll find underneath the cap. Um, and another question I feel like a lot of people ask is, um, what's the difference between uh, fungi and lichen? Well, uh, so I, uh, I had to kind of look this up actually, because I, somewhere in the back of my brain knew it, but I think it's really important to understand how unique lichen is because uh, lichens are a symbiotic partnership of two organisms, a fungus and an algae. And the dominant partner is the fungus, which uh, the USDA says gives the lichen the majority of its characteristics um, from its thallus shape to its fruiting body. So that's the thallus shape is um, like a flat shape um, and it varies in looks. So, which is pretty cool. A lot of people think that, um, that they are beautiful. Some people um, don't think that, um, some people don't, don't like the look of them, but they're not, um, they're unsightly, but they're not uh, deadly for the tree. And so the term, um, uh, oh, I want to talk about uh, fungal diseases. So just because, so um, mushroom are in the kingdom fungi. And the, as I mentioned, the mushroom is the fruiting body, but um, not all fungi produce mushrooms. But I did want to talk about, because this is a talk on mushrooms and because they're so closely related, you know, because it is a, a type of fungi, I want to talk about fungal diseases. So as I mentioned in my tree pests and disease talk, um, which you can go back and check that out. I mentioned a lot more, but these are just ones that you'll find around here. One of them is anthracnose. It's unsightly, but not deadly. Um, and it's kind of like a broad term, kind of like how uh, fibromyalgia in humans is a little broad, but you're just gonna see it um, on random plants sometimes and just don't be too concerned. And if you're ever concerned about a plant or uh, not a plant, but a tree, <laughs> call an arborist. Um, so there's also powdery mildew. Um, that, this is a really common fungus as well. Um, prevention includes just giving your plant enough sun, uh, selectively pruning it, um, or pick a variety that's uh, resistant to it. And there's also root rot, um, which uh, the host is just many species. It's caused by overwatering and poor drainage. Um, and so um, there are, it's really, um, it does happen, you know, it just, it does happen to plants, but you know, some, some of the symptoms include stunting, wilting, discolored leaves and brown roots. And it really can happen in any season. If your plant, if your uh, plant or if your tree is being uh, overwatered or not getting enough uh, drainage. Um, there's also laurel wilt, which is uh, Raffaella lauricola. So that was spread by, um, by uh, ambrosia beetle, uh, red bay ambrosia beetle, and it is a fungal disease that kill that has a mortality rate of 75 to 97 percent, 
um, with the trees that it infest, infects, and it, um, it includes in, uh, infecting the laurel family so that it's been a, a huge impact on the avocado uh, and red bay trees as well as sassafras around here. Um, there's also the sugarberry dieback. Um, if you might have noticed, um, recently, meaning in the last 15 years or so, a lot of the sugarberries, particularly in this area, have shown a lot of symptoms of sugarberry dieback, but um, experts actually still aren't really sure about what is causing it, but they're pretty sure a fungus is causing it. And they're thinking that this little guy is responsible for it. It's an Asian woody aphid. And so they're thinking that maybe that was introduced and it had a fungus on it. So a lot of these, um, a lot of these um, invasive, potentially harmful uh, to native species, a lot of these fungi are introduced via insects that are introduced a lot of the times via uh, pallets or any sort of uh, wood material that's being shipped uh, abroad. So um, there's also, um, so I, oh, I also wanted to talk about well, where can you find mushrooms? <laughs> so this is um, important to preserve uh, our natural areas because a lot of the times the woods are where you find mushrooms. This is why it's important to preserve trees. Um, so uh, if you are a mushroom enthusiast and you know, you want to keep doing that. It's very important to be active in and informed about a lot of natural areas and the preservation of it. Um, a lot of lichen can be really great indicators of pollution. So it's um, that's a really interesting fact that uh, is about fungi. And um, a lot of mushrooms obviously are on the ground. So you want to just be aware of kind of the area that you're collecting in. Um, and uh, a lot of mushrooms are also difficult to grow indoors. So this is also why we wanna preserve natural areas because um, if you don't have that, it's, it, you destroy the mushroom habitat as well. So some tips before looking are, you know, for optional gear, maybe a hand lens and ID guides. I would say that maybe ID guides just um, lean on the less optional gear, um, but it's always good to go out there with someone who um, knows what they're talking about and, um, it's also good to have good hiking shoes, um, general knowledge of plants and animals in the area, both, both venomous and poisonous. Um, there's uh, a first aid kit, obviously, is always great. Um, just general wood, being generally woods wise, <laughs> whenever you go out and look for things in the woods. Um, this is not to deter anybody, but it's just to say, be careful and um, have fun because I think it's a really great activity to do. Um, I'm really, really happy that Willow has kind of taken me under her wing and took me out a lot in Maine. Um, and that was an experience that I really, really enjoyed. And so um, a lot of resources, if you're looking for any, is uh, Ansel Jacques at Swampy Appleseed. Um, not trying to be partial here. I do know that there are other farmers <laughs> at the, at the uh, farmer's market vendors, but uh, I'm not really sure uh, who. So I'll go maybe check that out this Saturday and kind of get talking to a lot more of the uh, local uh, mushroom experts. Um, statewide, there's Trees Atlanta. They have um, a, a great website that talks about um, the mushroom tree relationships as well. Um, there's UGA extensions are always fantastic. There's a uh, grow your own shiitake mushrooms page that I found. And um, there's also a mushroom garden at uh, UGA. Um, nationwide, so uh, a lot of my photos came from Learn Your Land, which is an incredible source. And if you're ever up north, uh, check out Willow at Flora Funga Farms. Um, and that's pretty much all I have. So if there are any questions, I will take them now. Oh, okay, Olivia. Um, so the alternative to being a mycorrhizal species. So mycorrhizal species um, are also symbiotic. So the alternative would be parasitic or uh, saprophytic. So parasitic would basically be that one organism, which is generally the mushroom benefits and the tree does not. Um, saprophytic is that the, um, the mushroom itself will actually feed off the tree, but it's already dead. And there is kind of a blurred line between that. Um, because I mentioned that the tree sometimes can be kind of uh, already on its way out. So the mushroom blur line between parasitic and saprophytic is kind of kind of there. Yeah, or for instance, if you have a, a very old tree that's like three or 400 feet tall, you know, like 
especially like on the west coast or with old growth forests or in the jungle where you have like tremendously tall trees that are like many hundreds of years old the only part of the tree that's alive is the cambium on the outside you know just underneath the bark and the bark itself and so all that heartwood is like susceptible to rot by not only parasitic trees which can affect the cambium and the heartwood but also to just like any saprophytic fungus that happens to find its way inside um, mm -hmm. and is exposed to the heartwood so if you often find trees um, in the woods when you're walking around um, that are completely hollowed out. Um, and so you'll find these trees that like you can like stick your head inside and look all the way up, you know, 100 feet and see the sky out the top of the tree, but it's still living, has branches on it. Um, and so those trees are much more susceptible to damage from wind, even though they're not necessarily being killed by the fungus they're more likely to die as a result of that fungal infection. Yeah, and so uh, here, whenever uh, you have the Arbor certification, and then there's also a track certification, which is tree risk assessment qualification. And a lot of the times they teach you that, you know, even if you do your entire due diligence, you know, as a, a risk assessor, um, you still can miss some things because sometimes trees are completely hollow and or they'll have hollow portions. Um, that you, you know, that the fungus kind of gets inside and you don't, you can't really see it from the outside. So there are uh, certain instruments that you can use to kind of tap the tree and basically um, hear whether or not there's resonance happening just to see how hollow it is. Um, so yeah, that's kind of an interesting thing that can happen is that the, the mushroom species can just um, infest the tree on the inside um, that you might not even see from the outside. So thanks for that, Will. All right. Um, yeah. And if there's no more questions, um, Sydney, uh -huh. I dropped you in another resource for Forager Chick. She does oh. um, lectures with five year certifications for wild um, sourcing mushrooms um, across several states during the winter months out at oh, Oakland great. Island. OK, great. Thank you. That's great. Well, thanks everyone so for being very um, participatory. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you joining me um, on this nice Tuesday night. Um, so if you have any more questions or any more comments, I would love to hear them. Uh, and you can just email us at info at savannatree.com. Um, you can also visit savannatree.org for any uh, tree related um, inquiries. And, um, or you can call us at 912-233-TREE. Um, so thank you so much. And I hope you all have a great night.